finished it, everything's done, and then either shortly, intraoperatively near the end, or when I get upstairs, I'm probably dosing the, the next narcotic at that mm -hmm. point to give some pain. Is that why they hook them up to like the PTAs, a lot of PTAs, like in PACU, like a lot of our neurosurgery cases? So or those, that yeah, that's, I think that's the, the department's preference. Yeah. Um, I mean, spinal cord, spinal uh, cases are, are definitely very painful. Um, and so that's why they use it. They come out on like a 23 hour observation on a PCA. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that their decision is that way, rather than just taking PO meds like we do for most 23 hour ops. Um, but that's their preference mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's worked well for them. So yeah, I, don't know. I feel like they've been doing it less and less actually. I don't think they really do it. Yeah. They, they used to do it every time. They've listened yeah. to you. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, there is like, but the thing oh, is, they have the shortage, then they change their. Well, yeah. you, make a, you make a good point, though, right? You got a patient that's scheduled for 23 hour observations, they're coming out of surgery and they get a push button and they get to control it. It used to be that's probably what it was. But now we're trying to get patients with the ERAS home quicker, less yeah. opioids. So why not try to get them to take meds by mouth and control their pain there? And that's probably the better option we see. Neuromuscular blocking agents. So now we're going to switch from now the anesthetic stuff now to what we use uh, a lot as well for, for most cases, which we call neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, they allow for us to, to facilitate um, intubation. They allow us to be on mechanical ventilation if you need it long term, uh, and surgical relaxation are your biggest things. Um, there's two types of forms. There's the polarizing agent. There's only one that's succinylcholine, and then your um, non-depolarizing agents. Uh, and there's a few different types of those that we'll discuss. It. How succinylcholine works, uh, it's a persistent agonism, so it's constantly firing at the acetylcholine receptor, uh, allowing for muscle relaxation for about five to 10 minutes. Uh, and then it dis dissipates after it's broken down. All right, uh, usually give about 0.6 to one milligram per kilogram is your dose. Uh, it is metabolized by these pseudocholinesterases. So another enzyme that breaks this medication down to let to make it not active. Uh, I put on the side like there's one in three thousand have an abnormal pseudocholinesterase. So occasionally we may have a patient in, and they go under we use such no choline for like an ENT procedure or something, or we needed to rapidly sequence uh, intubate this patient uh, for whatever reason. So we use such no choline, and 30 minutes later we don't have twitches back. And it's because they have an abnormal pseudocholinesterase, so they're not able to break down the medication. Is there a medical condition that that typically happens with? Yeah, it's a pseudocholinesterase deficiency. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's that's in there. The pseudocholinesterase deficiency uh, is what what that's called. Unfortunately, we're able we we have that experience. It usually wears off over time. It take there's no way to reverse it, mm -hmm. uh, but it wears off over time. And then you're able to take the breathing tube out. Um, <laughs> Contraindications to using such no choline is a depolarizing agent. Um, the reason that it's contraindicated is because um, you get an up if there's an upregulation of these acetylcholine receptors, you can um, get a, an efflux of um, potassium and actually cause hyperkalemia and a cardiac arrest. So you see this in burn injury patients within 24 to 48 hours after their injury. Um, muscular dystrophy patients or kids like theirs, myotonia, so muscle weaknesses, prolonged immobility. I tend not to use this agent when I'm in the ICU um, because most patients have an ICU myopathy or weakness, and so they could have this upregulation of receptors. Any crush injuries, upper, upper motor neuron diseases, and then patients that are recent strokes or immobile because of their strokes. You could still use it in a patient that had a history of a CVA coming for an elective case but you have to just be cautious and think about it. It's not contraindicated in patients with renal disease, um, but you would see we always do check potassium levels frequently on those patients that have end-stage renal disease, mm -hmm. if you do have this flux. The amount that it, the potassium flux that you'll have is usually about 0.5 or 0.5 milliequivalents is what we see. Um, and you're not gonna really see a cardiac arrest or anything that you get the potassium greater than six. Most of us are, my high number is like five and a half. I wouldn't get it then. But it all depends on the patient and if you can expect these things. And the thought about, part about anesthesia that I like is you can anticipate a lot of things. And about residency is what I'm trying to learn is how do I anticipate, Thank yes ma'am, certain things that can happen, okay? Um, 
we don't use this medication in, in ocular surgery if they have an open globe injury because it can cause an increase in intraocular pressure about an extrusion through that globe of intraocular content. So that's an option we don't use for. And then this is one medication that we talk about with malignant hyperthermia patients. And I'll go into that a little bit. Our non-depolarizing agents we use, they cause competitive uh, inhibition, so competitive inhibition at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor uh, in, the neuro, in the neuromuscular junction. Rocuronium, vecuronium, and cisatricurium are our three main agents that we use out of non-depolarizing. Vivacurium used to be here. We don't have that anymore. Um, i trying to think of the other ones. Yeah, these are the biggest three that, I, that I've used. Okay. Um, for rocuronium, my dose is 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, is my intubating dose. I, can, I use this medication, like if I'm in the ICU, for example, I need to rapid, rapidly sequence, I intubate someone, I will use that dose, so we call the RSI dose is 1.2 milligrams per kilogram, so it's double the dose. Vecuronium is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram for the intubating dose. So, um, they are metabolized in any part of the liver and, and in the kidney, so both uh, types of metabolism. Uh, therefore, if someone did have hepatic or renal dysfunction, I would probably go in to use cisatricurium uh, as my uh, neuromuscular locking agent. Uh, and the reason is degraded by Hoffman elimination, uh, which means it's diet at appropriate temperatures is degraded within the bloodstream. Are you seeing a lot more of mixing of the different agents um, to have a kind of different effect during surgery? No, ma'am, usually no? not. The two agents that you may see mixed are rocuronium and vecuronium. Mm -hmm. um, unless, for, what, for an instance, and I'll give you a case that I did, but most of I usually use rocuronium and vecuronium. Um, but for example, I had a lady who uh, actually wrote the pa paper up and, and a poster and, and took it to a conference. A lady was in a motor vehicle accident, had a spinal cord injury in the cervical. Uh, we were going to do the case. I couldn't use suctional choline, but I needed, her, uh, I needed a neuromuscular locking agent was my plan to intubate. But we were also doing neuromonitoring, and they were going to monitor some evoked potentials um, for looking for spinal cord injury. So therefore, what we did is we used uh, the double dose, so the 1.2 milligrams per kilo of rocuronium, uh, along with my induction agents of propofol and fentanyl and lidocaine. Uh, we were able to secure the airway because she was in a sea collar uh, and things like that. We placed the breathing tube. Shortly after, fortunately now, Sugamidex is around, uh, which is a medication to reverse the rocuronium and vecuronium. Um, and so I was able to reverse it. Um, we proceeded with the case. Uh, they did neuromonitoring and things. And then the surgeon had requested for some muscle relaxation uh, for surgical purposes uh, after our baseline exams were done. And so I used this at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, when we give these muscle, muscle relaxants or neuromuscular locking agents, however you'd like to choose to, uh, to name them, uh, we monitor the residual par paralysis or muscle relaxation with a train of four. Uh, you can do it in multiple fashions. You see some people use the facial nerve. Um, I, if I can, I have the arm, I like to use the adductor pollicis muscle, um, which is supplied by the ulnar nerve and that's movement of the thumb. So when I do my train of four twitching and I see this, this is what I'm looking for, is the adduction of the thumb coming over. Um, we usually do it by feel. But technically, you're supposed to do train of four with a ratio monitor to your 0.9. Um, but in practice, we don't have those you know, monitors to say it's whatever strength. So the biggest thing is by, by feeling an appropriate reversal. And that's how we titrate our reversal agent. Okay. Um, the number one cause of anaphylaxis within the, within during the, the perioperative period is muscle relaxants, number one, and then antibiotics. Talked about the Sugamidex dosing, which is a medication that uh, was approved by the FDA in 2015 for a reversal of rocuronium and vecuronium. Okay. Um, as long as their train of four is appropriate, it's how we dose the two milligrams per kilogram. Um, so usually, if they have a train of four, we say at two, so full two full twitches out of four. 
-hmm. that we need. Uh, then we can use the two milligram per kilo dose. If they have zero, I can go all the way up to 16 milligrams per kilo dose. And what Sugamidex does um, is it encapsulates the rocky rhodium or vacuum and it takes it out of its activity, so it encapsulates it. If you use, um, or you can use uh, with any three of agents, or rocky rhodium, or cisatricurum, you can reverse those with um, acetylcholine anti uh, cholinesterase inhibitor, which would be your uh, neostigmine, um, and then you counteract the cholinergic effects with glycoparyl. Mark, which is the yes. one that is reversed with fatty, um, the fatty fluid? I know when somebody is having a problem, like when they're getting a spinal or whatever, and they feel like they've over lipids. So the intralipid, yeah. so intralipid is for is for local anesthetic agents, and we'll talk about intralipid. Okay, I'm sorry. Yep, okay. yep. So that's the thing, the glucagon anesthesia is a lot that you can give and then you reverse it. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep it separate. Yeah, intralipid is used if they've got a local anesthetic toxicity and we'll talk about it. Just mentioned as antibiotics are the number two reason that you can have anaphylaxis or some type of allergic reaction. The biggest ones we use are, are cephalosporins, uh, so cefaslin or ANCEP, cefoxetin if they have a um, colorectal case. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times though we're recommending using cefaslin to cover your anaerobic uh, bacteria within, uh, within its colorectal or abdominal case. Vancomycin uh, is another agent that we use uh, to mainly cover MRSA patients. And actually at Grand Rounds this morning, we were talking with uh, Dr. Michelle Dahl and uh, Dr. Bierman were there giving us an update on perioperative antibiotics. And they're even recommending now if a patient, as long as they're not allergic, but if they're MRSA positive, they screen MRSA for positive for MRSA, and we want to, the surgeon has ordered vancomycin, then it, we'd also need to cover for MSSA and other skin flora, then you can actually give vancomycin and cefacin. The vancomycin, you know, we'd like to give it at least 120 minutes prior to surgical incision, that's why it's ordered and, and often get started in a perioperative period in PSU. Um, and then cefacin, we dose it in the operating room. Mm -hmm. Okay. Zosin, uh, or another beta-lactam, piperacillin, tazobactam, uh, another agent that we use, and then gentamicin, mainly for your urological procedures. Uh, we, don't, we don't really use it that much unless we absolutely have to. Uh, going in now to talk about some side effects of anesthesia, we see the post-operative nausea and vomiting. Uh, just to frequently discuss that, it is a frequent complication that we see uh, within anesthesia, unfortunately metric that we monitor for outcomes. Uh, it can delay discharge, not only from the PACU, but also from, from with y'all in PSU. Um, so it's very metric that we like to look at. Uh, it's very complex in the neurotransmitters or agents that involve it. So I've got those listed. You've got muscarinic receptors, dopamine, histamine, the 5-hydroxy uh, tryptamine, which is that 5-HT, which is which what Zofran attacks. Mm -hmm. okay? Um, Neurocannin 1, which is one agent, we can talk about those that we use with some of our colorectal cases here, uh, and then substance P. These risk factors, probably most of y'all in this room, young females, non-smokers, got a history of POMV or, or even car sickness, um, ear, nose, and throat, laparoscopic uh, surgery, and strabismus ocular surgery um, can, can lead to a lot. What can actually cause it? So our inhalational anesthetics, or our volatiles, we call them, nitrous, opioid use, duration of the anesthesia, and then neostigmine. And the reason neostigmine is because it functions at the muscarinic receptor. So that's another reason why it happens. Okay. So what agents do we use to give? Big ones, Zofran. You see it all the time. Four to eight milligrams uh, dosing. Um, it, the downfall of Zofran, it can cause that prolongation of the QTC. Mm -hmm. um, so usually the perioperative period, as long as I'm looking at making sure their, e, their EKG is okay and the QTC is not too prolonged, I'm okay with giving it. Um, Decadron or um, dexmethasone, a, a steroid we use, four to eight milligrams as well. You see sometimes we will use the 10, um, but most of the evidence has shown four to eight milligrams can give you some uh, POMV prophylaxis. It's funny, I put on there as a side effect is perianal itching. I actually had a case like that before. Um, 
guy was waking up and actually regurgitated. I'd already given him Zofran. We got him comfortable, made sure he cleaned his stomach.